Hey everyone, welcome to Reawaken Your Brilliance. I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I had lots of turkey. I eat it twice a year, so I really enjoyed it. I get this great email every day called Daily Om, and so tonight's thought of the day is uh, one that I took from today. The need to fill an imaginary void by shopping or eating, drinking drugs, whatever the choice may be, is a symptom of disconnection from our true selves. When we connect to our center, we access the fullness of who we are as an individual spirit. We also connect to the energy source of the universe from which nothing can be lacking. So maybe the next time you feel yourself wanting to eat, drink, or whatever it is that you like to do, stop and take a deep breath and try to reconnect to your true self. Now we're going to tell you about tonight's guest. In 1986, Barbara Allen developed reactive arthritis, a condition similar to rheumatoid arthritis. For five years, the joints in her body were so painful that she could not walk more than a few feet at a time, could not stand for more than a few minutes at a time, and often could not do even such simple, everyday things as turn doorknobs due to the arthritis pain in her hands. As long as she only did what her doctors recommended, she continued to get worse. Her response was to spend years investigating alternative health uh, restoration modalities. Now she can easily ride 30 to 50 miles on her bicycle, walk, and stand for long periods. She has no residual joint pain. Her goal is now to show others what she did and how it can help them conquer their own arthritis. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you very much, Julie. We're thrilled to have you on the show. So first, for people out there, uh, I read Barbara's book. It's very comprehensive. And so I want her to start at the beginning and explain to people, what is arthritis? Because in your book, you talk about that it's commonly misdiagnosed. So can you tell us a little bit about it in layman's terms, what exactly it is and what the symptoms are? Okay. Well, the basic word arthritis comes from the word arth, which means joint, and itis, which means inflammation. And there are over a hundred different conditions that fall under this category of arthritis where the joints get inflamed. And it can be very difficult in the first five years or so of having arthritis to even know which type of arthritis you have. And and so, for instance, you talk about uh reactive arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So is there a big difference between those two or with every type of arthritis, it's a basic inflammation of the joints? Well, with each disease, there's a basic inflammation of the joint. And then there are a few details that are different between the different types. So with reactive arthritis, the reason it has that name is because I was reacting against a bacterial infection, ah, okay. and that's what triggered the inflammation in my joints. So I was on vacation, and I had gotten food poisoning, which was a bacterial infection called Shigella, and so they knew what triggered my arthritis, so that's why it got that name. With rheumatoid arthritis, there's often not a known trigger, although it's often triggered by stress when people look back on, on what triggered it. Um, With some other types of arthritis, they may be like psoriatic arthritis, may or may not come with um, psoriasis and ankylosing spondylitis, which is another common type of arthritis, usually has spinal involvement. So there are nuances between how you treat each one, but the very large class still responds to anything that's going to help you get over an autoimmune disease, anything that's going to help your body come back into balance so that you no longer have inflammation in your joints and don't need to be attacking that part of your body. Can you tell people, because I found it very interesting in your book, again, not having a medical background or knowing much about arthritis, that many people are misdiagnosed. And so can you talk about uh, what symptoms people should look for, if there are questions that they should be asking themselves? Because I've had friends, I have someone, a friend who has Sjogren's, which Mm -hmm. uh, is an inflammatory disease. And it took a while to get a diagnosis. And, you know, in the meantime, she's having to run through tests and it was very frustrating. So if you can offer any suggestions or talk about symptoms. So if someone out there maybe is struggling, this might be Mm -hmm. something that they have and aren't aware of. Right. Well, if you only want to do the Western medical route 
um, it does become important to get a diagnosis that's correct eventually. But what's true is that the diagnostic tests that are available usually can't determine which form you have until several years into the disease. Sometimes they'll be able to tell right away. So the first first thing is some people get very upset when they can't be diagnosed, but that's mm -hmm. actually a very good prognosis for your healing because it hasn't progressed very far. So any kind of natural cure method that you were going to use then to help build your body, to help restore your digestive system, to help lower the levels of inflammation in your body can have a very good effect then because it takes less effort to tip your body back into the health mode and out of the arthritis mode. Once, you're, once you've actually gone so far that it's easy to diagnose what type of arthritis you have, you actually have to do many, many more things right mm -hmm. to, to leave the arthritis mode and to return back to the health mode. So I should ask another question now, and, and I hopefully haven't misstated this when I was talking about you being the next guest. Have you mm -hmm. cured arthritis, or do you never actually cure it, and it's something that's always with you, but you can uh, moderate the condition? Well, in my particular case, I had severe arthritis for about five years, and when I first started, the, the first thing that worked for me for controlling the inflammation was I went on a juice fast. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a miracle. That was the first time in four and a half years that I wasn't in severe pain. And just the break from the pain was miraculous. And it took 11 years total before I totally figured out how to stay well. But at this point in my life, I have no arthritis. You, you can't see it on x-rays. I don't feel it in my body. So for me, it's been a total conquering of the arthritis. Um, it depends very much on how severe your arthritis is, mm -hmm. what degree of recovery you can have. So somebody that already has really severe joint damage, it's relatively easy to get the inflammation back under control, but it's it's um, very unlikely that they'll be able to totally heal the def um, deformities that may have already happened in their joints. So it, it depends on how early you catch it, Got it and how severe your arthritis is. So but for many people, they are able to either get a, a total recovery or, you know, like a 90% improvement. Mm -hmm. So what you're the only person that I know of. Uh, or at least a book that's out there that takes a complete body, mind, spirit approach to conquering arthritis. So tell me a little bit what led you, you know, we talked in your, uh, in your bio how what the doctors were telling you to do wasn't working and you were getting worse. So you said juicing, you mentioned a little bit ago that that was the first thing and you stopped your pain. So is that, how did you stumble upon juicing and what kind of got you and led you down this path to solve your arthritis? Well, I was very much in the Western medical mindset when I got sick. I was studying molecular biology at Washington University in St. Louis, which is one of the premier medical research institutions in the United States. And I had worked in, while I was doing my PhD work, um, I had rotated through various labs that were doing medical research. So um, I had some of the best minds in the world to bounce ideas off of. And for about four years, I kept looking only within that paradigm. And I, I finally hit a place of despair because everything that might work for me was still somewhere between 10 and 15 years before it would be clinically available. And even then there was no guarantee that any of it would work. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I one of the things I love about St. Louis is they also have one of the best public library systems in the nation. And I lived right next to the very last of the Carnegie and Dalmet libraries. So I had this amazingly beautiful library in my neighborhood to go to. And I just started reading all the lay literature on everything that promised to restore health, to stop pain. And, and if it had anything to do with arthritis, that was a bonus. Mm -hmm. But I just knew I had to go back to ground zero. And everything that I read, 
I would then go back to the Washington University in St. Louis Medical School Library and see if I could find any validation within the medical literature for that working. So there's anybody with arthritis who's spent any time looking at what is supposed to help arthritis knows that there's a lot of really crackpot stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't willing to experiment on myself if there was the, at least a glimmer of of something validating in the medical literature that said this isn't crazy, this would actually help. I wasn't willing to buy snake oil. Right, good. Well, we don't want to sell snake oil on this show for sure. Now, I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Barbara, you can call in at 919-518-9773, or if you have Skype, Computers 2K Voice, and ask your question, and I'm monitoring the chat room. So please, if you have a question, definitely put it out there, and we'll ask Barbara. So was juicing after all your research was juicing the first thing that you read about and had a little bit of, it looked like uh, scientific backing. And that's when you decided to try that. Um, well, I tried some other things first that didn't work and I don't even remember exactly what they were, but I stumbled upon two books at the same time. So there was a certain synergy and ideas. I might not have come up with my answer if I hadn't have been reading both books at the same time. But the first one is There is a Cure for Arthritis by Pavlo Arola. And he detailed how there's over a hundred year history in fasting clinics in Europe of successfully curing rheumatoid arthritis, which was very, very exciting to me. And another book was on food sensitivities. And the, the particular test that this book is about had been discredited, but it still was a fortuitous giving me the idea that when I started eating again, I needed to be really careful about which foods might trigger my arthritis. So the combination of fasting, which is more profoundly anti-inflammatory than any known drug, and the idea that foods could trigger my arthritis, and once I wasn't in inflammation anymore, if I reintroduced that food, then I'd be able to tell whether it was hurting me or not that was like the seminal idea for me because then then I had a way to it took me two years but I eventually identified all the foods that were triggering my arthritis and people don't have to do that anymore that was that was the pioneer way before I understood what was going on any better but I still got well you still got well that's what's important so you said in your book you must identify your food sensitivities to recover from arthritis so why is this so important um it's because Chronic inflammation is almost always triggered by something called delayed food hypersensitivities, or sometimes it's just called delayed food sem sensitivities. And it's a type 4 immune system reaction. And the reason it's so hard to, to ferret out all these reactions is because instead of with classical food allergies where you react to a food within seconds or minutes, mm -hmm. so you have immediate feedback. Most people know what their classical food allergies are. The type of food reactions that are behind arthritis um, usually take hours to days from when you're first exposed to that substance to when you feel the inflammation in your body. But would you, probably most people wouldn't, when you say feel the inflammation, do you mean just feel pain? Because if you right. say, okay. All right, yeah, usually me. the first thing that happens when your your inflammation is triggered, and, and this is useful because it can help you catch it earlier and earlier, but the first thing is usually you feel a sudden shift in mood and you don't know why. So everything's ah. still fine externally, but you feel, feel like bitching or, you know, and you don't know why. Right. Wow. You know, that really makes me think a lot because there are mm -hmm. sometimes I just feel it comes out of nowhere, like very mm -hmm. angry, for instance. And so exactly. that's interesting. I wouldn't have made that connection. So for people out there, again, and so just so we differentiate a classical food allergy, I have, unfortunately, North Carolina is horrible to live in if you have allergies, but I because as a child, I got tested for a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Like I'm allergic to cats. Uh, I'm not allergic to any food per se, but probably what a lot of people are familiar with that when they stick it in your back or your arms and all the things and you're in the doctor's office and if you're like, I'm allergic to cats, so that thing blows up. So they would find out immediately. So how mm -hmm. is someone going to know if they have a food sensitivity? Well, first off, 
they're not going to know if they go to a regular allergist because they're going to use usually either something called an antibody test. Sometimes it's called an ELISA, and that's yeah. going to test for the wrong thing. Or they're going to have a skin rest test, and that's yeah. where they put the allergens on your skin. And then if you raise a wheel, you know, a, a red spot, then, then you know you're reacting. So that's classical food allergies. When doctors say there's no connection between food and arthritis, they're talking about classical food allergies, and there really is no connection. So what you can do to know what your um, food sensitivities are, or either take a test called the ALCAT blood test, or you can do something on your own called selective elimination and reintroduction. So if you're successful in totally eliminating your problem foods, um, usually for seven days if you're eating or five days if you're fasting, your body will clean out the, the problem reactions quicker if you're fasting. Then when you reintroduce, you'll be in a state of hypersensitivity and it will be easier to tell that you have these sensitivities. And often they're your favorite foods that you're eating every day. <laughs> and until you have a break from them, you're, you're like a drug addict who's developed a certain level of tolerance for the thing that's hurting you. And until your system cleans out and unmasks that reaction, it's actually very hard to tell um, mm -hmm. that you're having that reaction. So it's kind of similar to what babies, when you first have a baby and are introducing the food, I don't have any children, but my understanding or memory with my nieces and nephew is have the carrots for a week or two to make sure that that's good and then mm -hmm. move on to the next thing. So in, in that case, not they're not looking for food sensitivity, but looking for rather a food allergy, correct? Correct. Okay. So, and you state this stuff much more eloquently than I do. So if you, so this is a great, so people can do this diet. So how do they start out? How do they do the diet? You know, they just go on fruits and vegetables for a couple of weeks and then introduce one food at a time over just once. Uh, how will they know? I mean, will they just immediately feel pain? Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. Well, there's several ways to do this. And one is something called a lambs and pear diet. So this probably wouldn't work as well in England where they have lamb a lot, but you pick two foods that you, you, have no, you'd have no history of having a problem with, but you don't normally eat. Oh, okay. And that's all you eat for seven days. So that allows you to eat, but presumably you're not having any kind of reaction, so your body will calm down and any of the the foods that had been causing a problem will clear from your body. And then when you're in the reintroduction phase, you introduce only one new food a day. And you just watch to see, once I've had this, within a few hours, do I have a mood shift, a negative mood shift? Do mm -hmm. I get a cloudy mind? Do my joints start to ache? Um, and if you don't, then that food's fine and then you go on to the next food. If you do have a reaction, you can't test anymore until that clears because it will confound your results. So you go back on, if you picked lambs and pears, those two safe foods plus whatever safe foods you've already discovered in the testing process until you're feeling good again, and then you'll test. So that's one way to do it. Okay, Barbara, we actually have a question about this. About the, okay. uh, It's from Warrior Spirit who chatted it in. They want to know, is red meat often the culprit, and what are the most common problem foods that people have um, food sensitivities to? I can give you a list, but before I do that, let me tell you that one of the biggest ways people have confused themselves using my book is I have a list of foods that can commonly cause problems sometimes and seldom. And just know that it's pretty random mm -hmm. whether you're going to, which list you're going to have reactions against. So you, even if I give you the most common foods people react against, you may, may still have one that's like way out of the ballpark. So you, you have to catch them all to stop the inflammation. Oh, so, so with that, repeat that because I think that's really important. You've got to catch them all. 
to right. reduce so, the inflammation. So if you have 10 foods that are triggering your inflammation and you only catch nine, you're still going to have inflammation. Got it. Because see, my theory would be like, oh, if I'm, 10 are causing inflammation, we'll just do one or two, then maybe that's okay. So that's a, a good point to stress. Now, I'm curious, once you find out you have a food sensitivity then this is it for life. You will always have a food sensitive sensitivity to whatever it is. You just can't, like if you were to do this and not eat cheese for five years, would the sensitivity go away or it's always there? Uh, well, luckily for most food sensitivities, if you avoid that food for somewhere between six months and two years, probably 90% of those sensitivities will go away. There may okay. be some that you'll keep all your life but it's not a given. So okay. I was on an extremely restricted diet when I was healing. And because I also did work with meditation and very deep levels of releasing anger and fear, mm -hmm. I'm unusual, but I have zero foods that can trigger inflammation in my body now. Interesting. Now I want to so remind that arthritis everyone... pattern isn't there to be triggered anymore. So, so sorry, say that again. So the pattern's not there to be triggered anymore, correct? Correct. Yeah, I, my physiology changed in some profound way, and I even know the day it happened. I had been going through about eight months of of meditations that my intuition said would probably were necessary to heal. I had no idea when I would finally hit the tipping point, mm -hmm. but there was one one day in August. I think it was August second, nineteen ninety nine. At the end of an hour meditation, I knew I didn't have food sensitivities anymore. It took me a whole day to get the courage to test it. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to tell you, you look fantastic. I mean, we're on Skype, but you look healthy. There's a glow to you. So you either have a fantastic makeup artist, but it just, <laughs> but you know, I believe you can't fake that glow that's within. And when you were truly healthy and we'll talk, I would definitely want to get to the other things that you're doing to, uh, to cure arthritis, but it just, it comes across that way. And, you know, I've read your book, which is, is so comprehensive and I'm going to encourage anyone out there that suffers from this. I mean, her research is exhaustive. She covers many topics. It's really, if you're looking for a primer to start, this is a place. And I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Barbara, I mean, that's what she's here for. Please call in at 919-518-9773, or you can computers 2k voice for a question or chat it and i will make sure that we ask barbara so can you talk i know that you said that you know you do have a comprehensive list in your book but can you like for instance we hear about gluten-free and i know personally for me when i don't eat gluten i feel fantastic and mm -hmm. but is that is a, a, a gluten a food sensitivity and is, is that something i mean though even though people who suffer gluten intolerance don't necessarily have arthritis is that uh i guess i'm just trying to find out about the bigger picture is this because we're, we've been eating more processed foods over the years and that the body has become more sensitive to that do you have any thoughts on that uh yes so almost any food that that we eat probably triggers arthritis in someone so you can't you can't just avoid all the foods that people say cause arthritis or you won't have anything left to eat. So that's why it's important to individually test. Okay, so Barbara, we've got that, that being said, probably about half the people that come to me and do testing with me, so I I I have their blood test results and it's 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 Hello? pretty much in stone which foods they're reacting to, at least at the time of the test. Okay, Barbara, Probably about half a... those people have an issue with gluten. So that's a very, very common one. Okay. And is it all right if I go back to Warrior Spirit's question, too? Um, I don't it, want... It, we've, got a, we've got a caller, so hold on a second. We'll go back to Warrior Spirit. But hey, thanks for calling. Who's this? This is Pat. Hey, Pat. What's your question for Barbara? Uh, well, I've worked with Barbara um, the past couple of years, and I have had the LCAT test, and she is right. I mean, I did have like over 20 foods that I was sensitive to that I can all I can eat now. So that you can eat the foods now. Right. Um, I do have rheumatoid arthritis, but I've also found out, and I do have um, a gluten problem and a dairy problem. Uh. And and Barbara has um, helped me, and I'm working with an apropath doctor now because I had also had candida. And now I'm going through um, more testing, 
and they think that my rheumatoid arthritis was caused because of the gluten sensitivity because I never, ever had stomach aches or anything of the typical gluten problems that people have. How interesting. And so now that you've figured out these sensitivities, how is your arthritis doing? Well, I'm still on, on a lot of medicine, but mm. what they're trying to do now is to heal my gut. I have a leaky gut. Okay. So it is going to be at least six to eighteen, six months to 18 months before um, that's going to heal. They said I'm on a lot of probiotics, prebiotics, digestive enzymes. But truly, Barbara, I mean, she helped me. I would never be where I am today if, if it wasn't for her as far as finding out all of this stuff. That's fantastic. Well, we're glad that you're on the road to recovery. That's good to hear. Mm-hmm. I just, I did have a question for her. Though. Sure, go because ahead. It's been three and a half years since I, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, after, it was been maybe six months after I was diagnosed that I found out that I had a gluten and dairy problem, so I got off of all of that right away. Is it still possible for my body to heal from the rheumatoid arthritis even though it's been three and a half years and I'm still trying to work with it? Uh, Yes, it is. Um, I have one woman that I've been working with in Louisiana who's in her 60s and she had it for about 40 years. She's probably 95% better now, um, Mm -hmm. even after all those years of having rheumatoid arthritis. So the key thing is to heal my gut. Right. If you can heal your gut and keep it healed, that's going to be the critical piece for you. Okay. Well, I thank you very much, really. I thank you a lot for, you've been a godsend for me. You really helped me a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for calling in. Thank you, Pat. We appreciate it. And glad you're on the road to better health. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Can you just explain really quickly, Barbara, for people who li- who are listening, because Pat mentioned leaky gut, and they might mm-hmm. not know what that is. So if you can touch on that, and maybe I believe Pat said with the gluten intolerance that that caused her arthritis, which I just find very interesting because I would have never guessed that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes. So this was the most surprising thing that I found when I started looking at the lay literature about what actually worked for healing arthritis because it's not, it's starting to go into mainstream medicine now, but 10, 15 years ago when this, when I was doing this research, nobody was talking about that in in med schools. So what, even though the problem is in the joints, what, what's the underlying cause is that when the gut gets disrupted by stress or by antibiotics, sometimes by surgery, um, sometimes by something like a gluten sensitivity, um, there's something called leaky gut. So normally, in a healthy person, almost no food will get into the bloodstream until it's fully digested. But with leaky gut, you start getting partially digested food into your bloodstream and your immune system starts reacting against your food. It thinks it's a foreign invader that needs to be destroyed. And so antibodies will latch on that, and then cells that are going to destroy it will latch on to that, and you get this big complex that then settles out into joints because Ah. joints don't have very good circulation. The only circulation they have is passive circulation when when you move. Mm -hmm. So they're like a backwater. They're, they're kind of like the swamp of the body. <laughs> oh, okay. Ugh. Yeah. And so when when those complexes settle in the joints, then you start getting inflammation, and then the friendly fire of the body is what's destroying the joints. Uh, and, and, so, and the body's effort to fight what it believes is a foreign invader, it's actually doing more harm than good, but it believes it's doing something good. Exactly. So that's why it takes, when you're eating, seven days for the inflammation to go away when when you stop eating the problem food because you've still got those antibody complexes in your joints. Okay. And so it takes a little while for you to move enough so that they're cleared. Got it. Now, before I forget, I, you would wanted to jump back to Warrior Spirits question, which, to remind people if they're just listening, is red meat often the culprit? This is to food sensitivity sensitivities, and what is the most common problem food? Um, sometimes red meat is a problem. Um, 
I actually sometimes have to convince vegans because they're reacting to so many of their vegetarian sources of protein that very briefly, long enough to heal their sensitivities, they actually need to eat a little bit of meat. And sometimes because they haven't had red meat in years and years, they have absolutely no reaction to red meat. So it's ironic. But sometimes what has to happen to heal is that you briefly need to eat meat while you heal your reaction against things like beans. Now, I know, I believe, if I remember correctly, and if I'm wrong, I'm sure you'll let me know, but you are a fan of the eat right for your blood type, correct? Um, I am, but it has been so misinterpreted by people that have read my book that I almost wish I hadn't put it in. And this mm -hmm. is the reason. It is absolutely accurate at the level of population biology. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, like for instance, I'm a type A, if you look at the level of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, yes, that's true about type A's. But for me in particular, even though type A's are supposed to be the most reactive against the nightshades, I've never had a problem with tomatoes or potatoes. Mm -hmm. For about two years, I had a problem with eggplant and maybe for a year I had a problem with green peppers. But if you go on that diet rigidly, instead of being individually tested, you're likely, because you're not gonna catch every single one of right. your inflammatory triggers, you're likely to still stay sick. So if you use that as a substitute for being individually tested, you're probably not gonna get well. If you use that as a very interesting intellectual exercise that helps guide you towards mm -hmm. what you need to do, but you don't take it as the Bible, then yes, it's very, very helpful. Well, that's good. So for someone, I mean, that's hard. I had a friend who had gluten uh, issues, and so he did a year-long detox and diet. And I mean, the guy made his own yogurt. I mean, it was crazy. I, I would have gone nuts but for someone who's like okay you know what i don't think i'm up for that then checking out this diet and finding out what it says would be a good first step for someone to do and then go on from there right and maybe about 10 percent of people if they do the eat right for their type blood type it will be so so right on for them that they won't need to do anything else well i'm but the neanderthal type and so <laughs> I know when I eat lean meats, and I was a vegetarian for 15 years, but when I eat lean meats, lots of greens, and go gluten-free, I feel fantastic. Now, of mm -hmm. course, I love dairy, and that's something that's, you know, I, that I don't do well with. And I, it would be interesting. I'm After reading your book, I am really uh, want to try this because I'm convinced that I'm going to do it. And they're like, ah, eh, cheese, nope. It's that I have a, I wouldn't be shocked if I had a food sensitivity to it. Mm -hmm. Now, do you find, I, Warrior Spirit asked about red meat, but is dairy another one, like gluten, that a lot of people have a food sensitivity to? Right. Um, many people have a reaction to dairy. Many people have a reaction to gluten. Um, I'm always very sad when the test results come up with a candidia issue, but when that's present, that's the very most important thing to treat first. And why is that? Um, it's because if you're getting yeast from the inside of your body, there's no way to get a break from it. Okay. And so it's impossible to heal it until that's brought under control. Okay. And now I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Barbara, you can tell she's a wealth of knowledge. Please do not hesitate to chat. I will ask your question for you, or you can call in at 919-518-9773, or, you know, if you're across the country like Pat was, Skype us at Computers 2K Voice. Now, Barbara, we've got a lot, and I know you have a lot in your book, um, but I want to get on to some other subjects that you talk about. Can vitamins and supplements be helpful to someone who's suffering from arthritis? What, is, what have you found on your journey? They can be very, very helpful. But what's important first is to call off the war so your body can start healing. So you have to discover all your food sensitivities first and cut those out. Okay. So what's tricky about vitamins and supplements is they often have many, many different source materials. So for instance, B vitamins often are derived from yeast. So if you're mm -hmm. reacting against yeast, 
then you have to find a source that doesn't have yeast. Or um, it's actually fairly common, like what your spirit said, for somebody to react against beef. Mm-hmm. And here's here's where knowledge is power. Um, who would have thought that gelatin capsules could trigger a beef allergy? Oh. Uh, they, they can because commercially, unless it says vegetarian source only, most gelatin is either made from beef or pork from the, from the mm-hmm. bones and the skin, and there are enough allergens to trigger that and keep your immune system riled up. So then part of, besides this elimination, then label, reading your labels is going to be key, whether it's food, vitamins, supplements, whatever. That's, that's going to be a huge part of this journey, obviously. Correct. And, and it gets even a little trickier because it's not only what we put in our mouth and swallow, it's also anything we put in our mouth. So, for instance, if you have a corn sensitivity and your toothpaste has an artificial ah, sweetener, mm-hmm. um, almost all of those sweeteners have as an excipient. So an excipient is an ingredient that's added that doesn't have to be put on the label. Um, they're 90% corn and only you know 5 or 10% of the sweetener. Then every time you put the toothpaste in your mouth, your corn sensitivity will get triggered. Well, I'm convinced that sugar is is a legalized drug. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think I when I have done detoxes and not to and then I have sugar after that. First of all, I, I literally get sick, but mm-hmm. I'm just convinced it's like I call diet coke diet crack that that stuff. Ha- well, I don't know whatever it is, but it it hooks you. And I and I think you know I try to use stevia, agave, anything besides sugar. But I'm convinced that sugar affects your mood that it's just it's truly a legalized drug Mm -hmm. and one of the things i love about the alcat test is not only will sugar itself have addictive properties and immune system altering properties but the source material from the sugar can also trigger inflammation at a whole nother level so if you know that you can't have cane sugar or you can't have beet sugar or you can't have dates or, you know, it's very useful because sometimes, especially when you're trying to get off sugar, it's, it's easier not to do it cold turkey. It's mm-hmm. easier to gradually come off it. So it's nice to know which forms of sweetener are going to hurt you less. Yeah, that is good information. Now, talk to me about exercise when you were, because, I mean, you went from being in a wheelchair and being in so much pain you could barely walk now you bike 30 to 50 miles so i want you to talk about exercise but also when you're in a lot of pain is there exercise or something that people can do when they're in a really painful stage that will still benefit them i mean i believe exercise is fantastic and helps your mood it helps your body but if someone's in a lot of pain are there options that you can suggest for them as well uh yes so Exercise is absolutely critical for somebody with arthritis who wants to get well. They've done studies where they have splinted the arms of young men in college that are totally healthy and kept a splint on for six weeks. And the pathological changes that happened in their elbow joint under a microscope were identical to the changes you see in rheumatoid arthritis. So. So what happens when somebody has arthritis is often because their joints hurt, they keep them still, and that will make the problem worse. Uh, So what's critical is at least once a day, but preferably three or four or five times a day, to take all your joints through their full range of motion. And that may change, you know, from... What I can do now and what I can do in five minutes may change. Maybe I can only do a little bit, but that motion is going to bring new nutrients into your joints Mm -hmm. and it's going to flush out those antibody complexes that are causing the inflammation. So it's absolutely critical to move and it's good if you actually do that with your whole body, every single joint. So I know... Sometimes people are so debilitated they can't even do that on their own. So if you have whoever your caretaker is or who's helping you, your children, your spouse, your best friend, um, maybe some sort of nursing care, if you can ask them to very passively move your joints through their range of motion, 
that's that's a critical part of getting well. So that's on the extreme end of disability. But even even if you just have mild arthritis, doing the range of motion, then doing an aerobic component is extremely important for overall health, and it will help regulate your immune system. So if you're able to do some sort of aerobic component, do. But make it something gentle that won't hurt your joint. So maybe you can't run, but you could bike, or you could walk or you could ballroom dance, or you could garden, or you could mm-hmm. swim. And and the more you enjoy what you choose, the better. Now and I... then what's really exciting is they found that even women, and, and men too, that are in the middle of a flare with rheumatoid arthritis, as long as they are careful, they can do weightlifting that will actually help them get out of the flare. So... So keeping your muscles strong is extremely important for protecting your joints. So you need to work within your limits, but you know, don't if you can't lift five pounds, lift one. Mm-hmm. If you can't lift twenty pounds, but you can lift fifteen, lift that. But but that in and of itself will help your posture. Will will help flush out the toxins in your in your joints. It will also. Um, Increase your bone density, which is a problem when you're too sedentary. So it will strengthen your joints at the level of your bones as well. Now, what about would massage be beneficial? Because you mentioned earlier that the joints are the swamps of our body. So if someone mm-hmm. would that be something or, you know, there are different types of massage like lymphatic or stretching massage, would that be beneficial? That depends very much on how sensitive you are and whether you can find a good massage therapist. So for me, massage was very helpful in getting well. But when I was in a flare, if I had somebody that wouldn't honor honor my body and was too rough, they could actually put me in a much worse flare, which was not good. So you would encourage anyone who is working with a massage therapist to say, hey, I have a form of arthritis and explain that to them. And I think most therapists would be really good and uh, Mm -hmm. it'd be beneficial if they had training in that. But just your main advice is, hey, let them know that this is what's going on. Exactly. And if they don't listen to you, don't go back to them. Find somebody else. Absolutely. Great advice. I always, whatever your gut says, intuition, if you'd feel comfortable with someone, I know when people call me, I'm like, hey, check around, call other people too, because you should feel very comfortable with the person that you want to work with, especially in something as personal as massage. And I want to encourage everyone, if you have a question for Barbara, she is a wealth of knowledge, please call in at 919-518-9773, or you can Skype in at Computers 2K Voice, or I'm monitoring the chat room, and I know that she would be more than honored to ask answer your questions. Now, Barbara, you had a couple things. I try to learn as much about anything alternative as I can, and there are a couple treatments in your book that I had never heard of, so I would love for you to talk about them. What is provocation neutralization treatment? So that's something that was developed in England, and it uses a enzyme whose name I'm not recalling right now, but it will put a little bit of the problem food plus the enzyme that tells your immune system to calm down. Um, they'll, they'll put that um, just under your skin, and then over time that will actually teach your immune system to calm down around that particular food. So it's similar to homeopathy? Yes, Okay, except that it sounds like it's instead of uh, homeopathy putting a pill under your tongue with X number, is this more um, geared towards your specific things as opposed to something for the masses, and it's, and it's how is it inserted into your skin? Um, I, I didn't actually have that done. It was something I was researching at okay. the time. Um, so that, that was something I discovered the fasting and then I was able to start controlling my symptoms by withdrawing the food. Mm-hmm. But I include it because sometimes people will have, you know, if you're reacting to 200 foods, it becomes almost impossible to eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. I know right. That, that was... So that's, um, it's a little bit like homeopathy because you're put using a small amount of what's hurting you. And it's a little bit like Western medicine because mm-hmm. you're using 
an enzyme that the immune system recognizes as a signal to calm down. Oh, okay. All right. Good to know. And then yeah. can you explain what enzyme potentiated desensitization is? Desensitization. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, it's part of that same, same treatment and it was originally called one name. And then as it developed a little further, it became known by the other name in the U S. Okay. And what I should say is, I believe it was two years ago, there were clinical trials and it, um, it's not, it actually didn't get approved in the U S for reasons that are very unclear. The drug so you do have to go to perhaps. England to find that treatment. Okay. Drug companies would be my guess, but I probably can't say that in public, but oh well. Um, now, I'm really curious because you recommend meditation, so talk to us about this and why you found that it's helpful for curing arthritis. Right. Well, there are never any guarantees that meditation will cure anything that's physical, but what is true is that people who have a physical disability that is very rare to cure, like arthritis. The people that get well are the ones that pursue not just what physical treatments are available, mm -hmm. but they look at what spiritual modalities are available. How can I clean up my emotional life? How can I clean up my mental life? Because each of those can give you an edge in your healing. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 1000% on that. So were there any other things uh, in the body, mind, spirit realm besides meditation that you found to be helpful? Do you think yoga would help people or any other things that you found or that because you've talked to a lot of people that they found help them on their journey? Right. Anything that appeals to you in the mind body realm is likely to help you. So for some people, it's yoga. For some people, it's Tai Chi. For some people, it's a classical meditation, um, like I used a Vipassana practice. Mm -hmm. um, and all those are documented in the medical literature to have positive changes on the immune system and to help arthritis. Uh, not so much directly the meditation. It will, it, what it's been shown is that it will increase, decrease your stress hormones, mm -hmm. which will help you get out of inflammation. It will increase hormones that will calm down your inflammation. Well, it's wow. interesting. Dr. Oz has mentioned several times that he believes energy medicine is the next frontier yeah. and the frontier that's here and starting, which I find very encouraged because you have a classically trained Western medicine doctor who's like, hey, look at your diet. You've got to exercise and yeah, energy yeah. medicine's out there and it works. So that, that makes me very hopeful. I'd love for you to talk a moment about myofascial triggers, what they are, explain what they are, and why it's important to know about them. Okay. This was a total revelation for me. After I had healed my gut and no longer had the food sensitivities, I still thought that I had some permanent damage to my hands whenever I would use them and carry a lot of weight, the knuckles would hurt. And again, I went to the St. Louis Public Library and found a book on myofascial trigger points in the free pile of all places. Uh -huh. And it turned out that for me, I don't know how well this will show on Skype, but on the triceps, there's a place that can be tight that will refer pain to the knuckles. So it took about a minute or two to release that tight spot. And I've never had that arthritis feeling pain in my hands again. And there are points all over the body that can refer points, refer pain to distant parts. And a lot of times as we get older, we're not actually developing arthritis. We're, we're developing these myofascial trigger points that make oh. us feel stiff and make us feel arthritic. And with a good massage therapist, or if you learn how to do this technique on your own and you release them, you know, in, in a few minutes, you can be released from what felt like a life sentence of pain and stiffness. So that's why it's so exciting to me. Um, we have a question for Warrior Spirit, although I have a quick question, and I wouldn't expect you to know this. Do you, by any chance, remember what the myofascial trigger would be for the knees? Because I've noticed as, I, as I've gotten older that I feel pain in my knees more so. And I mean, I was very athletic as a child, played tons of sports, and I'm, you know, still walk and exercise, but not 
you know, like ice hockey and things like that. So just curious if you remember, if not, I'll Google it, but just if okay. you remember where the point trigger point for the knee was. Um, I don't, and there's very, very complex patterns in the body. And anybody that wants to look it up, the Bible of myofascial trigger points was um, created by Janet Travell. Okay. She was an MD who actually believed her patients and spent years mapping these patterns, even though she didn't know why it was true, and developing ways to release the um, pain. Oh, excellent. Um, she, she was actually the physician for John F. Kennedy and was instrumental in getting him out of pain enough to run for the presidency. Oh, good. I learned something I would have never learned anywhere else. Now, before mm -hmm. I forget, we here's our question from Warrior Spirit. I have arthritis in my right hand and can't stop working on the computer. So he needs this to do his job. He was thinking of getting acupuncture. Do you have any thoughts on acupuncture, if you've seen success with that for arthritis? Um, acupuncture is very dependent on the skill of the practitioner. And what usually happens in about 90% of the people I work with is that they get temporary relief, but there's never a permanent um, solution. So they may feel better for a week or two weeks but they get into a pattern of lifelong needing acupuncture. So mm -hmm. it's helpful, but it's not usually enough to resolve the issue. But, or at least that alone isn't usually enough. But since you mentioned the myofascial triggers, that the knuckles were the last part where you really felt your arthritis, perhaps that's mm -hmm. something where he could start with and specifically look um, at the trigger points or the one that you mentioned on the tricep, because if he has the arthritis in his hand then right. that would at least help with the knuckles. So that might be a, a good thing to work with. Now that makes me wonder, uh, besides acupuncture, and you explain why, what you think about that, were there any other alternative complementary medicines that you found to be beneficial uh, for working and getting rid of arthritis or helping that process? Uh, when somebody has a candidia issue, it's usually really important to find a naturopath mm. who understands how to overcome that condition. So don't go to just anyone because that's such a difficult thing to overcome that people can waste three, five years trying to get over candidia and not do it on their own or not do it if they don't have the right practitioner. Mm -hmm. But actually find somebody who has a track record of healing people. It's like going through diet boot camp for a year or two. It's not pleasant, but then you have the rest of your life healed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes naturopaths also have um, treatments that can help with leaky gut that can speed up the process as well. Okay, that's good advice. Now, are there other diseases that you found, because arthritis, the basis, my understanding, is inflammation. So... Would your book or this diet help anyone else that's suffering from some disease that, that starts with inflammation? Um, it has been surprising the number of different people that were at a dead end who have contacted me just in case what I have might help. So the, the man from Texas who's the head of the American Tinnitus Society took the ALCAT test with me and his... Uh, Tinnitus cleared up about 50%. He didn't get 100%. Um, with, with the dietary part of the book, usually hyperactivity calms down. Mm -hmm. Many skin conditions like eczema will calm down. Migraines, surprisingly, will calm down. Interesting. Um, any kind of autoimmune disease is likely to calm down and sometimes even go into total remission. Um, it's very variable, but... Um, what I attribute this to is just that it's allowing the body to heal at a deep level. And when you restore the vital energy, then the body knows what it needs to do to heal whatever. So can so, you talk about, because you've mentioned a couple, because I've only read your book and this is the first time we're meeting over Skype. If someone, what would a consult with you be like? Why would someone want to contact you? Um, well, most of the people I work with have rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And what I usually start them with is the ALCAT test. So once we have those results, we'll usually spend about three hours together looking at the test results, looking for all the hidden allergens that might trip them up. And that's the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. 
to make this work is you'd think once you knew the foods, it would be easy to avoid them. But if you have a hard one like soy, it's in so many things Mm -hmm. or corn or gluten. Um, There's really a whole education process of what products are safe for me. Right. Right. And then there's a, there's always the question when you have to change your dietary habits, what's left? How can Mm -hmm. I possibly eat? Right. Right. And so I try to make that fun and creative okay. um, and, um, and work with the personality of the person. Some people just want, you know, the same easy thing that they can do again and again. And mm-hmm. some people want the creative latitude. And I can work with whatever a person's personality style is. Okay. So about 50% of the people I work with can get very good symptomatic control with just the cat test. But wow. about fifty okay. percent of the people are like me. I the food only got me so far. I actually needed all nine secrets that the book is based on to totally heal. And so I had to do all the mind body stuff. I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't have that option in my healing not to do that. Right. Right. So so once I know a person, then we can decide on what the next thing is that they need to do and 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 see how far that will get them. Okay, so Barbara, there might be someone out listening that has a really severe case of arthritis. They might not know what's wrong with them. They just might be in a really desperate state. So what would you say to them? What words of encouragement would you say to help them? What would be your advice? I would say that knowledge is power and that just because your medical doctor has run out of solutions doesn't mean that there's not a whole other world of solutions. Um, to educate themselves as much as possible. So I found a set of solutions that work for me and many people with arthritis. Um, Sometimes people need different solutions than the ones I have because, as we talked about at the beginning of this interview, there are over 100 different types of arthritis, and everybody's a little different. But I would say don't give up hope that every time you learn something new about yourself and about how your arthritis works, that's going to give you leverage to heal. Fantastic advice. Now we have a question from Nicole on chat. She wants to know, what do you think about the GAPS, G-A-P-S, all in caps diet? Uh, That's not one I'm familiar with. Could she tell me a little bit about it? Hey, Nicole, if you can chat in and write in a little bit more about the GAPS diet, Barbara would be more than happy to answer because I'm not familiar with that either. So we'll give Nicole a moment to chat in about that uh, and see if she can give me more detail and get some thoughts from you. And so another question I want to ask you is, I'm here to start a revolution. I want everyone being happy, doing what they're meant to be, and, and grooving all night long. And I'm all about getting off the couch. So what one step could someone take tonight or tomorrow to reawaken their brilliance? What would you say? Um... I would say whatever it is that's holding you back is probably something you don't want to feel. And so figure out what it is that if you did just one thing, it would make your life better. Maybe it's, you know, resolving an issue with an old friend or Mm -hmm. maybe it's going out and getting an animal because you're lonely, whatever it is. But be willing to feel whatever's been blocking you and mm-hmm. just let it go. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. Now, if people would like to find out more information about you, um, can you tell us our website, your website, please? Yes, it's conqueringarthritis.com, C-O-N-Q-U-E-R-I-N-G-A-R-T-H-R-I-T-I-S.com. Okay. And then now I've talked about your book. If they are interested in your book, is that available on your website so they can find out more information about that? Yes, it's available on my website and it's also available on amazon.com. Okay. We found out a little bit more information from Nicole. So she says, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride created it to heal her child of autism. And now many people are doing the diet to heal their gut and thus heal autoimmune disorders such as RA. The diet heals the gut and thus heals diseases. That sounds excellent then. Okay. Fantastic. I, I don't know the details. So 
But it's if similar it's to what we've been talking about tonight because we had Pat call in and talked about leaky gut and, and gluten-free, and so we've touched on um, touched on some of that. So I think it would – it sounds good. I mean, it sounds very similar to things you've talked about tonight and that were able to help you on your healing journey. Right. What I do know is that occasionally when I'm giving a public talk, I'll have somebody come up to me and say – the diet you're talking about is what gave me back my autistic child. Mm -hmm. So, so I know that what heals the gut in autism is very similar to what heals the gut for arthritis. That's fascinating. I I think we could talk about this for another hour and process foods and all of that good stuff. But Barbara, we appreciate you being on. I've learned a ton. I would, everyone have read her book. If, if you suffer from inflammation or other issues or really looking to turn around your diet, I encourage you to check it out. It's very thorough and well-researched. So thank you, Barbara. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much, Julie. It's been a pleasure. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. You are tuned to Reawaken Your Brilliance on the Nissan Communications Network. Listen to some of our other programs like Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan Sundays 9 a.m. to noon. Attitude for Business with Mike Sink Mondays 3 to 3.30 p.m. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon Mondays 8 to 9 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch the program in its entirety or download an mp3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com.